Hi, everyone. I am Cynthia. I am a member of the Embrace and Diverse Week Steering Committee. I am also on the board of the Women's Business Connection, the Black Business Students, Day Students Association, and the Alliance for Latin Management at Anderson. Um, and so this event here is actually a collaboration between all these events, aka me collaborating with myself. But um, in any way, I'm really excited to um, have this panel and should be talking about what happens after you break the glass ceiling uh, and talking and exploring the complexities and opportunities women face in leadership. Um, and so without further ado, I want to get started. I want to turn it over to our awesome panelists. And so to start us off, I'd love for our audience to get to know you all a little more. I've had the chance to do so off this call, but if you could give us just a little background on who you are, where you're from, you know, what you did pre-Anderson, post-Anderson to get where you are today. If you remember back in Anderson, we called it the 32nd pitch. Um, so if you give us, if you give that to us, I would love to hear it. Um, let's start with uh, Sherry, let's start with you. Okay, great. I'm so glad to be here and honored to be a part of this panel. Um, so I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, um, and uh, here currently live here in Los Angeles. And before Anderson, I was a CPA at Arthur Anderson um, before they went belly up. Um, and I retired um, very early and went into sales at Xerox. And then I came to Anderson. And Pat, uh, after Anderson, I uh, worked in several different careers. I worked at Pepsi in marketing. I was the executive director of a nonprofit uh, called Inroads. Some of you may be aware of that. I was a career transition coach at uh, Drake Bing Warren, and um, which is an outplacement firm. I was in leadership at Avon, and then I also had my own um, training, uh, coaching, and OD consulting firm called Maximum Impact. So uh, today I am uh, at a company called Griffles. We're a pharmaceutical company that makes um, uh, money, makes plasma medicine out of plasma. And so I encourage you to donate plasma. Um, it saves people's lives. So um, I'm also a uh, coach and speaker uh, on work-life balance um, because I've written a book uh, called The ABCs of Self-Care. So that's a little bit about me. Awesome. Thank you so much. Laurel, do you want to go uh, next? Sure. Hi, um, my name's Laurel. I'm a Los Angeles native. I grew up in Glendora, the pride of the foothills, and also the home to uh, multiple smog alerts when I was growing up. Um, I have been a marketer my entire career. I started out in advertising at Ogilvy & Mather before going to Anderson. After Anderson, I worked at Nestle and Avery Dennison before um, working in the entertainment industry where I've spent most of my career. So I've had the really good fortune on working on some really great properties. I worked on track, um, Transformers, National Geographic, um, with studios like DreamWorks, Paramount Pictures, and most recently Disney. I was also with Fox prior to the acquisition. So I've managed quite a bit of change. I was in the home entertainment group, so i uh, worked on just managing change from DVD to Blu-ray to HD to streaming, um, and then managing just going from um, Fox arriving the acquisition um, and over to Disney. During the pandemic, I really had um, sort of a smear in the heart moment walking on the beach with my friend. She asked, she was talking about climate change and the fact that we're the last generation that has a chance to actually do something about it. And she just turned to me and said, what am I personally doing about it? And um, having worked on an inconvenient truth while I was at Paramount, I was always interested in climate action and this really, um, really, really made me think about what I was doing with my career and what I wanted to be doing going forward. And um, so that's why now I'm doing sustainability consulting um, and hoping to work with businesses to start to increase more sustainable management. So I'm really excited to be here um, to talk to you today. Thanks, Laurel. Excited to go into your journey more with you know, going from uh, working in large companies to starting your own venture. Um, and last but not least, Veronica, how about you introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Veronica Vasquez, and I graduated from Anderson uh, in 2011. 
Before Anderson, I was with Bank of America and responsible for banking center relationship deepening programs. Uh, and post Anderson, I joined Capital Group, where I'm currently responsible for the product management of separately managed accounts. And I'm also a member of Capital's North America DEI steering committee. Uh, in terms of my personal background, I'm a first generation Mexican American, LGBTQ plus woman that grew up in South Central Los Angeles. Uh, and all of those personal experiences have shaped my view on the importance of DEI and creating the spaces necessary for both women and underrepresented communities to advance their careers and truly feel a sense of belonging, you know, wherever they are in their organizations. And part of the reason I wanted to be here with you today, you know, is to share the importance of self-advocacy and leadership or an allyship rather, because it's critical for these stories to be known, to demystify what can feel like a really lonely experience when you're the only person in the room that looks like you. Uh, and so thank you for having me. That's awesome. Could not have said it better myself. I'm really excited to get started on the topics today because as you said, it can feel really daunting to be the only person in the room or they feel like the only person going on the journey that you're going on. Um, so with that in mind, I want to dive into how uh, we can go about navigating professional development. So Cher, you have you know over 20 years of coaching, you've done executive coaching, you have helped develop leaders and been in leadership yourself. So from your viewpoint as a coach, what have been the most common challenges you've seen women you've worked with face as they've navigated their professional development? Uh, sure, I'd be happy to answer that. And um, I probably am going to sound like a broken record, but I can't emphasize enough how important um, self-care is. And the biggest challenge I've seen uh, working, especially with women, uh, men not so much, but working with women, um, I, they see self-care as optional, that they will make time for it when they can. Um, but I see it as foundational. Um, something else that I see is they, a reluctance to develop wide relationships. So they say, oh, I don't like that person. Oh, I think they're, they're racist. I'm not gonna, um, or I think they're sexist. I'm not gonna develop a relationship with them. So um, I see a reluctance to develop um, wide relationships. I also see them not willing to sometimes develop their communication skills. And I'm not talking about being articulate. I'm talking about um, t having technique um, and strategies to communicate, to be visible um, and to share their accomplishments. I also think they spend too much time trying to be everything to everybody um, and do everything perfectly. So that's a, a bigger, bigger issue again with women um, than with men but I've seen that as a pattern. Um, I've also seen um, them um, being proud of being a superhero, trying to do it all um, because we've been socialized to believe, women at least have been socialized to believe that we should and can do it all. So I see those as uh, five to me, uh, the most important challenges, five of the most important challenges that I, I see women, professional women and leaders uh, ch be challenged. Laura, Veronica, what about you all? Um, like, do you have anything to add in terms of like limits you've witnessed when, you know, navigating leadership or dealing with other women who are also navigating leadership? Uh, Laurel, you know, we can start with you. Oh, I think just what Sherry was saying about um, communication styles is certainly something that, uh, and widening uh, your network of people, something that needs to be considered. I feel like a lot of times um, women, if, if they're, it's really tricky navigating how aggressive to be or how assertive to be. It's very stereotypical to say, but definitely encounter, um, you know, there might be times when um, not everyone in the room is going to like you or um, be on the same page with what you're saying. And I think um, women more often than not have a tendency to really want everyone to like you and share your opinion. And that doesn't always happen. And if you're okay with it, which you should be, um, sometimes, you know, people will accuse you of, you know, being really cold or, um, you know, just being super aggressive. So it's a really tricky thing to navigate. And I think for the men in the audience, it's definitely something that I would encourage you to um, be mindful of. Um, just like 
how women's communication is described versus a male colleague, which is typically never commented on. Like I've never experienced that in, in my professional life. Your yeah. About, oh, go ahead, Veronica. And just to add on to that, right? Um, you know, I think that there are sometimes limits that we put on ourselves, but there are also those that the people in your organization, however well meaning may be putting on you. And, you know, we all have unconscious biases. And to what Laurel was talking about, you know, one of the ones we need to recognize for women in particular is that of the double bind, right? I think that's a little bit of what you were describing. And stereotypically, you know, women, we're supposed to be nice, we're supposed to be kind, we're supposed to be compassionate, you know, and when you are all of those things, and all of a sudden, maybe you're perceived as being weak or less competent, right? And on the other hand, if you are assertive in your decision making and driving business outcomes, you know, then maybe your competency is acknowledged, but now you're seen as like unlikable, right? And it is just this really weird double bind uh, situation to find yourself in. And my personal experience uh, with this was, you know, getting year end feedback from my manager. Um, and this was like literally in my performance review that I was coming off as too confident, not sure how that could be like a thing that's in there, but it showed up uh, in my performance review uh, and that I was perceived as having sharp elbows, right? And I had like this aha moment in the middle of that review where I thought, you know, would I be getting this feedback if I were a white male? And I just felt the need for the question to come out of my mouth and like say it out loud. And I did. I put the question to my manager and something really surprising to me happened my manager agreed with me, you know, and it completely reshaped the tenor of our conversation and let me refocus on actual development opportunities. Um, so it, for me, it took something off the table that was like a distraction, right? And that was a huge moment for me, this whole experience in that instance, because I came to realize that one, despite others' best intentions. People have blind spots. People have unconscious biases, including the double bind. And two, if I hadn't self-advocated for myself in that moment, you know, those labels of being too confident, having too sharp, having sharp elbows, you know, that would have stuck with me to this day. So it was a really huge learning moment for me. I think, Veronica, you bring a, a great point about both the limitations that women might put on themselves because of how we've been socialized and like the messages we've seen about what makes like a, appropriate women in the workplace, but then also the people who also uphold those standards and messages and are sending them to us and like what is their responsibility and also um, creating a, an environment where we are able to lead and be an authentic selves without being judged for being too much of one thing or too much of another. Um, so we've talked about some of these challenges, but I also want to open the floor up to um, some solutions. So Sherry, on an individual level, what are common personal coaching tips you've given to women interested in leadership? And then on an organizational level, what are some key things you think organizations should to do to be more effective in fostering women leaders? Um, well, uh, first of all, um, so first it would be to, to protect your mental, physical and emotional health. Um, similar to what Simone de Biles did in the uh, Olympics. So practice self-care and use it as a preventive maintenance. So that, at an individual level, that's something you can do for yourself. I also think you need to uh, develop 360 degree relationships. So above you, below you, on the side, influential relationships that can help you to advance your career. And um, these are people that can advocate for you, whether you invite them to dinner or not, um, make um, build those relationships so that you can have a wide group of, of allies, as uh, Veronica and Laurel talked about, wanting to have those um, having those allies, and then learn to um, communicate strategically. Speak up for yourself in meetings. Um, some people are afraid to promote themselves, um, so find a way to uh, to do it in a strategic way without sounding too boastful, um, but at the same time making your opinions and your accomplishments known. Um, and then tie them to what's going on for the company so it doesn't seem so mm -hmm. self-serving. Um, I also think it's important to um, avoid perfectionism at all costs, personally and professionally. It takes too much time. Done is better than perfect. Stop trying to do 
everything perfectly because you don't have time for that. And you can make time for things that are more important if you do. And then finally, um, put the cape down. Ask for help. Get comfortable asking for help. No one can do it all. So ask for help at work, delegate, and at home, also delegate. And um, that means kids, um, husbands, sp spouses, everybody. Get everybody involved. Make it a teamwork. Make it teamwork. So that's on the individual level. So that's what you can do, and that's what you have control over. Um, and at the organizational level, I recommend that you um, ask about succession planning. Find out about the, the green boxes. Who's on the high potential list? Are you on the high potential list? Or um, are you being considered as a high potential? And that means you're high performing and high potential. So ask about succession planning. And if you're not on the list, find out how you can get on the list. Sometimes companies are not forthcoming in whether you're on the list. They might say you're highly value, valued. So find out as much as you can. Um, that's uh, Those wide relationships include someone in HR who could maybe give you some inside information. Um, I also rec uh, recommend that you really sincerely ask for honest feedback. And the, the feedback that Veronica got um, when she was in her performance appraisal and, and actually um, confronted her, the person, um, brilliant. And, and I highly recommend um, you in a polite way ask questions so that people can hear what you have to say, you know, not in a head turning, roll your eyes kind of way, but, you know, ask so people can hear um, and, and say you want actionable feedback, um, constructive actionable feedback, actionable feedback. And then look for mentors that can be turned into advocates. So to advance your career, you need to have someone who can advocate for you in those meetings that you're not in, in those meetings with senior leaders. So have people that can advocate for you. And again, they may not be your best friend or they may not be somebody you want to have over for dinner, but make sure you develop influential relationships in the company to advance your career. And then finally, give the perception at all times, no matter how much self-care you're doing, no matter how much um, you're doing um, to um, promote your own self-interest, make sure you sound like a company person, that you care about the priorities, you care about the values, you care about the projects that your boss cares about, make sure you're seen as a company person. I think those are really important um, points about dealing with the challenges, both at the individual and organizational level. Okay, anyone else have anything they want to add about, you know, maybe on the flip side of what, what you think organizations could do on their end to help foster women leadership? And, you know, I know that there's going to be a question in here around capital groups, DNI initiatives and stuff, but we have very specific, like, programs for there's actually a program called women leading capital uh that that those high potential uh associates that sherry was talking about all organizations have that list right she's right some are more forthcoming about uh, who's on there and even its existence but like it's it's there it's something that's talked about and when you look at these high potential associates you want to make sure that there is equitable access to getting to a place of equality. And that might mean sort of special programs for associates that do seem to have additional kind of hurdles to their success. And so in Capital Group, and I'll talk again about sort of my professional experience, right? Like I was part of that first cohort of women leading capital. I was assigned an advocate, very senior person in the organization, not just me, right? All of the women like in this cohort were assigned these very senior leaders. And I got to tell you, I feel like that made an impact in my career trajectory, right? And so it's being deliberate and programmatic to the extent possible to try to make some of these connections that frankly happen more naturally for other people, right? And maybe are more challenging for others and, and helping try to remove some of those barriers. I think you raise a really good point about how, you know, networking in the office, you're creating those connections that can help, you know, lead to advocacy or help you get down that path to leadership can come more naturally to some, especially for those who are underrepresented in these spaces and might not know that 
there is this list or might not know that there is a path to this trajectory, that this trajectory exists. Um, I think it is really important that organizations create that path and let people know that this path exists and has the programming to really put them on this pipeline um, that might not exist naturally. Um, and so actually I want to like talk further about, you know, the DEI initiatives at Capital. Um, and um, just, you know, because you are on the DEI steering committee there, mm-hmm. I would love to learn more about, you know, the, have you seen issues of equity and inclusion pop up in your work within finance? And, you know, how is Capital Group addressing it right now? Yeah, uh, you know, our employee resource groups, which we lovingly refer to as CG communities, um, you know, they were really at the fore of raising social consciousness at, at, at Capital Group or of Capital Group as a whole. Um, and I guess one of the examples that I'll point to is specifically CG's community, um, Capital Associates of African Descent, or it's called CADE, right? Like they were leading dialogue sessions with topics like the dangers of being Black in America, like before the murder of George Floyd, right? Like they were doing this stuff grassroots for a very long time. And what's really through this grassroots associate leadership and willingness to talk about, you know, the truly horrific experiences uh, that our black colleagues experience on a regular basis, you know, that was a gift that they gave to everyone that was willing and took the time to listen, right? Because it gave us, kind of like a collective understanding to more effectively process what was happening in our country, right? Um, You know, people starting to rise up, people of all stripes and colors rising up for social justice. It it gave us all sort of this common framework to, to think about it through, you know, listening to the experiences of our colleagues. You know, and while CG had had DNI plans for several years, I think the passion that we saw from CG associates unleash an unprecedented energy and level of visible commitment on the part of Capital's leadership team to, again, programmatically address DEI throughout the organization. So, for instance, we've instituted an enterprise-wide program called Advancing Racial Equity at Capital, and it has four goals for advancing DEI. You know, one is creating and fostering a diverse team of associates, right? So that's like casting a wider uh, recruiting net making ourselves accountable for candidate slates, hiring at HBCUs, et cetera. You know, two, leadership, commitment, and accountability. Now, DNI is a part of everyone's performance, uh, you know, yearly performance reviews, creating a culture of belonging at Capital Group. So we have a lot of educational programs around like anti-racism. We're also conducting a broad cultural assessment to figure out what else we could be doing. And also the last component that is working to impact our communities. And we have a lot of associate driven targeted charitable giving uh, with like a three times associate match, right? So there's a lot that's sort of happening there. And a lot of these programs are executed at the enterprise level, but individual lines of businesses are also accountable for driving their own initiatives and their own representation goals, right? We all have them. We're all kind of accountable for them at the line of business level. And it's this broad programmatic approach, you know, that's why I think we'll be successful in making progress towards DNI at Capital Group. But the passion and the drive of our associates is why I know we'll succeed. Like all of this stuff is happening because there's demand from the associate base and leadership has been really great about listening and giving the resources and time uh, to make sure that these things are actually being driven out. Yeah, and I would just um, build on that is that Um, I think a lot of big corporations offer these affinity groups and different support programs, but um, people don't always participate in them because they are like, I'm doing so much work or they can't take time out of their day from the meetings that they have or things that are going on. I think that's changed now with the tenor of what's going on in in our country, but really make the time to attend those sessions. A lot of planning goes into them, senior management's involved with them, and it is an opportunity for you to understand what your company is thinking about it and how you might participate and how you might influence um, what's going on there. I think as employees of organizations, we oftentimes sort of um, like 
assume leadership's taking care of things or just follow what's going on and don't realize how much power employees can have if they act collectively to voice concerns and opinions. Um, just as she was just saying, the, the employees really bring the passion and will bring the programs to life. So if you see those programs, make sure to participate in them. I mean, it seems like an easy thing, but it's really easy to skip that meeting um, because you're so involved in your actual work. Mm -hmm. But um, those, those programs are really important. Yes, that's Very. another... Uh, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say that that's another way of of building um, relationships, because as uh, Laurel said, um, you can build relationships with people with your peers who can support you um, at, at, if you're going through something or need some support um, another way professionally. Um, but also um, in in our uh, in our employee resource group at Griffles, a lot of um, those individuals are have access to senior management mm -hmm. um, in a way that um, you, you know some of some someone who's not in the organization um, doesn't have. So highly recommend that you get involved in, in those employee resource groups but, and try to focus on systemic ways that the company can provide um, DNI support. Um, so for example, like what, what Veronica is saying is having that um, people being responsible for it, accountable for it and their performance appraisals, that's progressive and, um, and very systemic in helping um, DNI uh, flourish in the organization, so it con <clears throat> not confront, but ask about ways that um, DNI can move beyond some of the uh, more basic um, celebrations and uh, employee resource groups. Mm -hmm. I think you all make you all make really good points about um, how the type of change you want to see. Um, it has to happen on a systemic level and everyone has to play a part. I think, Laurel, you brought a really good point about we might be, you know, as employees, you might think, oh, this is leadership's responsibility and, you know, whatever leadership does, you know, I guess, you know, that's what's going on. But um, I think it is really important to remember that we all have a part to play in addressing, you know, equity, diversity, inclusion outside of being on an explicit steering committee or outside of being a leader. Um, like Veronica mentioned, you know, you're having it now in performance reviews or having you know, each individual or each business line has their own goals as well. Um, it really goes to show the importance of having this movement be something that, you know, is both spearheaded by leadership, but also has like grassroots support um, and grassroots involvement. So thank you for sharing your experiences with that. Um, I do want to ask, um, as you know, some of us in the audience, we're really passionate about, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion work, um, but definitely have sometimes, you know, felt challenged by inertia we might have faced or bureaucracy, you know, within organizations you might have been a part of. And so, you know, Veronica, for you as someone who's like in the steering committee, has there been times where you felt, you know, things weren't moving fast enough or your ideas were being met with hesitancy and how did you deal with that? How did you navigate? You know, it, it's a really interesting question because, you know, there are a set of associates that will always think that things aren't moving fast enough. You know, and as far as I'm concerned, you know, that is a good thing because you need these very passionate people to keep momentum moving in the right direction. You know, but there's also a set of associates that may not be as excited about this progress <laughs> and actually think that you're moving too quickly. You know, there is that set of associates and you just need to be aware of that group because you don't want them to create unnecessary hurdles, you know, in your programs and as you're trying to make progress. Now, ultimately, you know, capital group, group has been very vocal, um, stating its support for advancing racial equity. And I'm proud of the resources, the time and energy that all CG associates are being asked to put into DEI. You know, and this ties back to what folks are talking about, about that grassroots um, sort of energy that you, that you want to make sure is there is, you know, when I first joined the DNI Steerco, I met with many existing members and former members, and they all gave me the same advice. It was, if there is something that you want to see done, just do it. Like, bring people along, but just put in the work, you know, and that's the attitude that I've taken on. And it couldn't have been better advice. And, you know, I can tell you from personal experience that leadership is eager to hear any good idea and will back initiatives that will have an impact. The difference maker in getting things done is whether there's enough associate demand and willingness to drive out the work. So I guess I would just politely challenge the audience here is if you want to see something done in your organization, 
the person you might be waiting for is you. Powerful. Um, Sherry, you want to yes. have something you have to add? Yes, I totally agree, Veronica. And I, and I think, you know, you should take responsibility for those things that you have control over and, and you can control, how, you know, the pace at which you want to go. I'd also just, um, as an OD professional, have to encourage you to also uh, be observant of the culture and also the appetite your boss has for some of these initiatives so that you don't overstep too far and um, be seen as someone who's too radical for the company and then therefore not um, suitable for leadership. So I just say, you know, we're always in that double bind is, you know, if you're not too assertive, if you're not assertive enough, you don't get your, your voice heard. But if you're um, too assertive, uh, that could um, come back and bite you as well. So just um, be cautious and be aware of your culture, um, your department's culture, your team's culture, your boss's um, appetite for DNI. All of those things have to be taken into consideration too. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Couldn't agree more, right? There's a maturation that sort of happens mm -hmm. within an organization and you need to be sensitive to where your organization is. Yes. Oh, that's all like incredible advice. I think that's something that I personally have to remind myself of is like remind, remind you like who am I talking to who am I dealing with and like where is it on me to meet them where they're at and then where is where is when's the appropriate time to push forward etc because it is a balancing act and you do still want to be listened to um, as much as I want to believe that I'm doing the right thing and I you know want to do it my way you do have to factor in that we're working organization and you have a lot of personal power but you also need to network and leverage that power appropriately within the organization that you're in. Um, so I want to move on from talking about, you know, DEI and i in the workplace. And I want to kind of go back to um, women in leadership and the paths that we take. So sometimes, you know, ascending into leadership can feel like completely uncharted territory, especially in spaces where women and particularly women of color have historically been underrepresented in said leadership or in said fields. Um, so I wanted to ask you, you know, when was the time in your own leadership journey or you felt you were stepping out of your comfort zone into something completely, un completely unfamiliar. And how did you navigate entering that unknown? Laura, we can start with you. Um, as mentioned earlier, you know, navigating that transition from working for major companies, you know, like Walt Disney Company, Paramount, to founding your own. So, I'd love to hear how you navigated that unfamiliarity. Um, well, I think for me, it's kind of something. And just going to Anderson, as I'm sure a lot of you are involved in the entrepreneurial program as well. I think I always sort of had the idea of man, if I worked as hard as I do for these companies, I could, for myself, like, what could I create? Um, so as I mentioned, I really had this, you know, stab in the heart about what, what am I going to do about climate change um, during the pandemic? And then I also got the opportunity um, to partner with one of my professors, actually, in sustainability to try to build this business and try to do something more. So I felt on one hand, because I had done so much work in my career already with marketing communication, that I was ready to take on the biggest marketing challenge there is to um, you know, drive change in organizations for more climate action. So part of it was um, just the time in my career and having built a, a skill set. So I think, and partnering with the right person. So where I feel I have you know, some shortcomings or more to learn, you know, my professor has been teaching the fundamentals of ESG reporting and sustainability and all of these things, I think, combined our um, skill set really can promote a lot of change. So I think it's definitely scary stepping out from a known quantity, um, known structures into something completely unknown. But I think it's just really um, what lights the head is so exciting. And I think everyone who's, you know, starting their careers now in business there's a huge shift starting um, in business towards much more like DEI is a huge topic of conversation, just a much more um, sustainable frame of business. So I think for me, um, the path forward was really, really led by the heart <laughs> um, more than anything and just having um, confidence in the skills that I've built to the organizations I've been at. So I'm looking forward to the challenges ahead and, you know, putting these forward. But I think the number one thing is, um, I think just building on what Cherry was saying earlier, 
you need um, not only a network of people in your organization, but for me, I have sort of like a board of directors um, of friends and mentors from past jobs and past um, workplaces that I really trust um, for advice and counsel. So if you have not only, um, you know, your organizational key set of your network, but sort of this personal board of directors that you can bounce ideas off of. Um, they gave me a lot of support and encouragement as well. And I think um, they're, it's really helpful to just get people, for me, my board of mentors includes people like finance people, it includes other marketing people, it includes actors, people on the talent side of the business. So just a variety of different people on the different points of view that can um, be your cheerleaders, but also be your like, um, your people to tell you when you're going too far or to rethink what you're doing. That um, also gave me a lot of confidence to press forward. So it sounds like a combination of your previous experience and the skills that you already have, plus your own passion, and as well as that board of directors that you make, that network you've been building throughout your career has really helped you feel that ready to take on um, this adventure, which I think is something we can all we can all learn from as we build our own careers and think about, you know, even entering paths that we never expected. I think when we have the experience and the skill set and the people supporting us, like it is accomplishable. Um, Read in the chat. Yeah. Personal board of directors, finding friends and mentors. That's really something that I'm going to keep in mind for myself as well. Um, so a question that we or a topic that we discuss a lot um, off this call that I thought would be, you know, very interesting to bring into this panel today um, is about work-life balance. Um, women are often cautioned about the importance of balancing planning your career with potentially planning for a family. Um, but regardless of, you know, if such when we want to start a family, balancing our professional lives, the personal lives, is something we all have to consider throughout our career. And we had a really big discussion on um, this and the kind of experiences and thought process that you all went through. So I wanted to ask you all, how have you navigated creating this balance of the personal professional for yourself? And also what are ways you think organizations can be more cognizant and inclusive of you know, people's lives and responsibilities outside of the workplace? Um, so just open the floor to anyone can start. Well, yeah. Um Go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say for me, I have two children um, and I think planning for families, if you're thinking about families, both uh, for the men and women in the audience, it's a huge decision. And I think um, the burden to women's career is obviously uh, much more daunting than it is to the dads in the audience. And um I think now, fortunately, with advances in medicine, there's a lot um, more that can be done to plan for family planning. If, if you're, you know, raising your eggs early, it's a kind of a crazy thing to think about. Um, but you you can do that now. Um, it just I felt like for me personally, when I had my children, it was right at the time when, you know, my career was really going up. So it's a big decision to make, and I think. Um, as far as what organizations should and can do to be supporting this, it's it's very tricky. I mean, I just saw that Kellogg's actually just announced that they're supporting, you know, um, fertilization treatments. They're paying for menopause and um, miscarriage leave. So they're really doing things to rec like recognize like what women in the workforce actually have to go through. So it's really excited to see that. But I think. Um, definitely a challenge um, balancing your career with your family life. And I think one thing that this pandemic has proven, and I hope, you know, um, for everyone in the audience can realize that people can get their work done from home. Um, and, you know, productivity doesn't slack off just because you're not in the office. So hopefully this will be much more um, helpful for parents and especially for women um, to have the opportunity to work from home a few days a week even you know when the pandemic's over to continue this would be very helpful. Veronica you wanted to share? Yeah um, listen I, I really like working at Capital Group in case that hasn't come across yet uh, I think it's a wonderful place to work with wonderful colleagues uh, but the fact is it's still a business that's looking to achieve outcomes for its 
preferred shareholders uh, and the clients that invest with us. And in order to drive business outcomes, any organization is willing to take from you as much as you are willing to give it. I think this is a very important point for all of us to acknowledge. Uh, so it's really you that needs to create the boundaries you need to achieve whatever work-life balance looks for you. And frankly, that, that work-life balance, or I like to think of it as an equilibrium, you know, it's going to change depending on where you are in both your personal and professional life. Like Laurel just stated, stated, right, like her priorities sort of shifted depending on where she was personally, where she was professionally. When I was a 22-year-old litigation consultant, I worked like 80 hours a week, and that was just fine with me. I was willing to supply more work hours, and my job was happy to demand it, right? Like that was the equilibrium that I, that I had in my life at the time. But where I am today, you know, what I'm willing to give is different. You know, when I'm on vacation, I'm not checking email. When I shut down my computer at the end of the day, which I do every day, I turn my computer off. Like I'm not checking BlackBerry Works on my iPhone, you know, and not every one of my colleagues can say that. And that's their choice. That's how, that's the boundary that they're setting for themselves in the organization. But for me personally, those are important boundaries and not just for myself, also for the people on my team, because I think it's important for me to model these behaviors for them, right? If I'm not checking email on vacation, I think that sends a pretty big signal that I don't expect them to do it either. And I want them to unplug, right? This is all like life's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Um, so I think you just need to figure out what your boundaries are, draw those lines, and then make sure to maintain them. That's excellent. I think what you said about, you know, organizations are willing to ask for whatever you're willing to give them is something that we all, all have to remind ourselves. Um, Sherry, yeah, I was going to ask, do you have anything else you want to add? Of course. Yeah, I've written a book about it. <laughs> but <laughs> I you wrote give, the book, Sherry. Yes, right. <laughs> I, I, won't go too, I won't go too far, but uh, what um, Veronica said is that, boy, uh, you have to set boundaries. You have to set boundaries. You have to say no, even though you want to appear like the company person and give the perception that you are pro company, you still have to take those times for yourself. Um, I took a two week vacation for the first time in years and I came back like um, a new woman. I felt like um, it, was, it was just incredible. Um, I work for a company based in Barcelona. They take the whole month of August off um, and then they come back refreshed and recharged. Um, and so I just really encourage you to, um, even if you don't have kids, and that was the, the for, for me, I was, you know, I, I have been married and um, divorced, but I never had kids. And so sometimes you, I got the, the impression that people wanted me to work more because I didn't have kids. Well, people who don't have kids need self-care and balance as well. So no, uh, so don't feel guilty that you want to take time for out, out for yourself because you will be a better professional and you will be more effective if you take that the take the time to to have that work life balance. And I think that um, vacation is a very easy thing to like delineate. That I'm not going to be answering on vacation. Although I have to say I'm very guilty. I always <laughs> answer <laughs> during vacation. And I think things are really changing. But for me personally, um, you know, I would go to things for my kids and I would say I personally had a doctor's appointment. Like uh, I, I would n not say I was doing it for my kids. I would turn my computer back on after dinner and be working until two or three in the morning to handle all my emails. Um, and this is definitely a common practice with a lot of the moms in at my workplaces. Um, so yes, it's, it's, it's one thing to say, this is what we should be doing. Um, and I definitely should be <laughs> probably not been working so much, but, um, and setting the boundaries is so important. I think it's much easier to do And it, at least for me, it's felt much easier to do as I became more senior and it's 100% right that senior leadership needs to set the tone. But I think, when you're coming up, it's very hard to manage that balance, especially, uh, and again, I guess this is just a thing I would encourage the men to be mindful in the audience of, is that, you know, just because a woman, 
becomes a mother or has children doesn't mean the career suddenly becomes less important or is like not something that she's worked for her entire life up until that point. Um, so it's very hard to let go. <laughs> like for me, I guess that's why I kept, you know, doing all these emails and kept trying to work at the same pace, but just for, you know, a more well-rounded individual, happy employee working for you, yeah. I think um, you need to set the course right. And I think like one thing that's just so interesting is I feel like the younger, younger people, <laughs> millennials, Gen Y, are so much more attuned to self-care and mm-hmm. setting these boundaries, which is phenomenal. It's like yeah. absolutely should be done. I know it, it's, it might be scary when you're coming up to push back and say, I'm not going to do this or that's, you know, these are the hours I'm working or whatever. But I think people understand it if you communicate effectively. Like I never expected people working for me to do what I was doing. I would always be like, listen, I can't get to these things until later. So I might be sending emails at a weird time or I would just try to schedule them so they would go out at like eight in the morning instead of, you know, two at night. Mm. Um but yeah, I just think it needs a lot of communication, open communication and dialogue and just making sure you stay on top of your work. I mean, no matter what, you need to stay on top of your work and your assignments. So, and it's up to you to figure out what time you can get those done. So um, the, I guess my advice would just be definitely set personal boundaries. Um, know your audience of who you're communicating. If you can actually like say, this is how I'm going to work it. Um and stick to it. And if you find that the place that you're working at is not amenable to, you know, the style that you want, make a change. I mean, that's so great. I, mean, I think it's really up to you to continue to check into yourself. Like, I think when you're in business school and you're thinking about what you're doing, you're really planning your career and think about what you want to do. And then you get into your job and you might get complacent. So I would just encourage you to continue evaluating your own progress and your own path, your own happiness at your place of work um, and keep pushing forward. I, but I think all of that really resonates. I mean, self-care is really important, but like you mentioned, we might feel more pressured or like we don't have enough power early on in our career. And so it, you know, it is up, you know, it is up to us to figure out, you know, how can we communicate that? Who do we communicate to? Do we have the room for this? And if we do, then stick to that and like be that example. Um, and so we talked a lot about, you know, what we can do as women, you know, to, um, you know, navigate our own challenges and opportunities. Um, but I also, you know, want to wrap things up and hopefully some time for questions. I'm um, talking about, you know, where we all um, as people, um, women or not, can go from here. So I'd love for the panelists to give us one call to action you have for our audience regarding what uh, we all can do to increase equity for women in business. Um, and, you know, Veronica, we can start with you. All right, I guess I'd say, uh, don't be afraid to advocate for yourself. You know, for women in particular, self-advocacy can sometimes feel, or even worse, be seen as self-promotional. But self-advocacy is simply communicating what you need, want, and hope to accomplish. You know, remember to self-advocate to make good on your potential and continue to grow your career path. Sherry, what about you? Well, I, um, I won't say self-care because um, you guys have gotten that message, I think. Um, I'd say is to proactively and intentionally mentor younger uh, leaders and also support uh, senior leaders, um, because even though they might not reach out, they still need support as well, senior leaders. So I would say um, mentor and, and support um, other female and, and um, diverse leaders within the company. And finally, it, <laughs> it does, it does. It really does. Um, I would say um, to not put limits on yourself. So when you get into uh, management roles um, or even when you're applying for jobs to, um, if you don't check all the boxes for experience or whatever it is, you can learn on the job. And there are plenty of applicants and I feel um, I've certainly seen this that more uh, male candidates will apply for positions I've had open that don't have all the the prerequisites. Then um, maybe there are women out there that have the same shortcomings and aren't applying. So I guess my number one thing would be don't limit yourself uh, when you're applying for jobs. Don't limit yourself when you get into 
an organization from volunteering to do bigger roles or take on bigger assignments because you're afraid you don't have the right skill set. You can ask for help within your organization and get your colleagues to help you and build the skills you need on the job. And you should certainly take advantage of those opportunities. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I will now we have we have time for one question. So if you have a question from the audience, I know we have some in the chat, but um, there are a lot in the chat. Uh, if you could raise your hand if you want to ask a question and then I, can, uh, you know, call on you so you can ask it. Any questions? Okay. Um, well, I guess I'll, oh, wait, we have one. All right, Isabella, go for it. Hi there, thank you all for being here today. It's been really insightful. Um, so thank you for joining us. My question is about communication style. We've talked a lot about how women can um, uh, advocate for themselves and position themselves in, uh, as leaders. Can you talk more specifically about specific, about communication styles that you see have seen be very effective and how these might differ from the way that men uh, communicate? Uh, yes, I'd like to take that one on um, because it's important to communicate um, differently sometimes with with men um, than you do communicate with women. Oftentimes as women, we use too many words to express ourselves and men get lost in the message. So I have a specific technique in the book that I describe as the headlines. Dr. Lois Franco created it where you talk in headlines. You give one, two, three um, facts and then you um, describe um, one or two points under those facts so that you are being real clear with your message and then you end with a call to action like we're doing on this panel. So that would be my recommendation. Anyone else wanna jump in? I mean, I'll just add on to I think Sherry's wonderful comments, like be direct right like you have to always make sure to communicate make sure you're communicating in a respectful way being really direct doesn't negate still being kind of re and respectful right you're just getting to your point getting from point a to point b in the shortest way possible and then there's no like mincing words right the thing is is that sometimes when we're trying to ask for something maybe we sandwich Yes. And we try to kind of make it a little bit more flowery to just to like make it land in a softer way. But it's actually counterproductive. Mm -hmm. You know, ask your question, make your ask, and then allow the other person to respond. And then listen very intently to what it is they're saying. Great, a great point. I think that's something I definitely have to struggle with myself as I had the tendency to um, we took our, we took a workplace big five, a workplace big five quiz and it said I have very high tact, but that also means I spent a lot of time writing emails that are like sandwiching things and wanting to soften the blow. <laughs> and so, and I know that these emails are being glossed over because I have too many words in them. So I think uh, something to remind her is that it is viable to be direct. Um, I see a question from John. So if you want to unmute yourself, go for it. Yeah. Hey, uh, thank you all for, for speaking today. It's been extremely helpful so far. Uh, Veronica, you mentioned earlier that you had a performance review in which uh, a manager said that you were too confident, which is typically feedback that wouldn't uh, be given to a, a male counterpart in that situation. And, and just a question to kind of anyone that, that has similar experiences, like what, what do you see as kind of common pitfalls of male managers that whether they're doing things deliberately or kind of subconsciously that makes women feel disempowered or uncomfortable or not being able to bring their full selves to the office? Well, um, I'll just say one experience that I had, which was I was actually told to get my hair cut in one of my reviews. Um, I don't think that would fly today, but I think the thing that um, managers can do is like we talked about here is recognize, you know, the full life that, that that women have, they might not. I think you know, for women, our quote unquote work uniform is much different for men, right? So men have like khakis in their shirt in the old days, but now that we're on Zoom, you know, it's a little bit different. Um, but like women's style, women's fashion comes in a lot of different 
ways, but that doesn't mean that they're any less effective if they dress one way versus a more corporate way. I think that's, a, to, to me, that, I mean, that was what that review was basically telling me I didn't like look the part. Um, so I think that's the, the number one thing. It's just, just because a person, uh, man or woman, looks different, dresses different. Like I think it's the brain power, the innovation and the ideas that people bring and it can come in a lot of different packages. And I think that's the whole point of DEI as well. Yeah, I think Sherry brings a really good point in the chat that I think happens as leaders who lack self-awareness and aren't curious about the experiences of people who aren't like them. I think that is definitely something that I think a lot of people in who are underrepresented environments, I think we face that as a common challenge, just feeling like the people around us just don't, are curious about our experiences or our full selves, and that prevents us from feeling like we can be our full selves. Um, I think another comment that we talked about off the call was, um, against the double standard of how, you know, if a man takes off of work because they want to, you know, bring their kids to a soccer game, that's being seen as like dad of the year. Whereas if a woman does the same thing, you know, it's, you know, typical, you know, not contributing to the company, you know, you're taking time for your kids. So I think being aware of those, you know, double standards and allowing both, you know, allowing everyone to be their full selves and respecting that they have full lives in and outside of work. And that, that like, doesn't affect you know, how strong of a contributor they are, I think is really important. All right, so we are at time. So I wanna thank you all for uh, joining this call. Jesse, did you wanna close us out? I'd love to, and thank you for the opportunity. I am very happy just listening to you continue talking. I feel like we got so many takeaways. Uh, we have a small document on our side. We're kind of just taking notes of the quotes uh, each of you said throughout this. And I was like, whoa, this document is filling up very quickly. Um, so just to wrap it all up, thank you guys for all the learnings that we got. Thank you all for joining, those of you who joined. And I look forward to seeing you at the next Embracing Diversity Week session. Thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you.